Welcome to Church on the Way in Modafontein, Johannesburg. Good to have you join us today. Maybe you watch stirred your faith and your love for our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been stirred through the preaching of God's Word, please like and subscribe to Church on the Way YouTube channel below. God bless you as you continue to follow Jesus. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you again. It's a great privilege to be able to share the Word of God with you today. And uh, I do greet you in the name of our Lord and trust that you are doing well. We are praying for you and we thank thanking God that in these trying times that he's for us and not against us. So we're trusting God for great things and not only during this time, but after this time as we follow our Lord in what he has for us. Can we pray before we go to the Word of God as we come to celebrate on this Passover weekend um, something of what God shared with me and I'd like to share that with you as we prepare our hearts and remember what Jesus has done for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for grace and the abundance of grace. You've been merciful to us and you've poured out your grace through your Son. And Lord, as we come to understand the reality of this grace of a, of a Passover and your great sacrifice of sending your son to die for us and to gain that we might gain life in you. We ask that every one of us would be in a place of gratitude and thankfulness this weekend and this time that we set aside to glorify you now. So Lord bless us as we hear your word today. In Jesus name. Amen. As I've been preparing for this time to celebrate Passover, and as we come together in our homes, I want to just share some thoughts about what is Passover and what does it mean to us. And we know the Passover from the time when Israel was delivered out of Israel, out of Egypt. And what we find there that God commanded them to put blood on their doorposts and it was the blood of a lamb and the angel of death would move over and none of their firstborn would die. And the rest of the nation, the first died. But we just see that uh, the great sacrifice that God made of sending his son, the Lamb of God, who is truly the, the Passover lamb for us, who has paid the price for our sins and our death. So I'd just like to share some of the chronological order of, of, of Passover week. And I've just done a little bit of study on it. And we understand from the study that the, the, the Jews get together to celebrate Passover and there's two two festivals that they celebrate at this time. It's the best festival of Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. And uh, I just want to just share with you what does the Passover week look like. And uh, we know from the Jewish calendar that that's the month of Nisan, which is our March and April. The, the Jewish calendar is based on the lunar cycle and our calendar is based on the solar cycle. But what's important to understand is that the, the Hebrew day <clears throat> and night are different to us. We run on a 24-hour cycle. Yes, they do, but it starts at different times. Their day starts at 6 p.m. and finishes at 6 p.m. the next day. And uh, the same goes right through. Their, their week starts from Saturday, 6 p.m. all the way to 6 p.m. the following Saturday. So what does the week, the, the Passover week look like? So on the Tuesday, um, we call it the day of preparation where they prepare for the Passover meal and they get together and, uh, and then they celebrate. And Jesus did that on the day of preparation, which we understand is the Wednesday day according to the Jewish calendar where Jesus was um, tried and crucified and buried. But he celebrated the Passover meal with them and, and instituted the Last Supper. And then on the, the Wednesday night to the Thursday day um, is the festival of, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which the Bible calls a high Sabbath. They come and remember the bread that was given to the Israelites in the desert, which represents our Lord. And then on the Friday, which is the morrow after, which is the wave sheaf offering, where the barley harvest is taken in and the first fruits are brought before our Lord. And that is representing the first fruits of our Jesus that has been given to us. And we see a reference in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. It talks about the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is Jesus. And in Colossians 
chapter 1, verse 15 to 18, we read here about he being the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, and Jesus being a first fruit, and he's the wave offering that was established before the Sabbath to say that he'll be the firstborn and the first fruits of God to bring eternal life to us. And then the Sabbath, which will be running from the Friday night to the Saturday night, um, this represents the end of effectively the Passover and the new day, the, the first day of the week starting again on Saturday at 6 p.m. So Jesus just reminds us Passover as we celebrate. Jesus is the Passover lamb and, and the wave sheaf offering was a, a promise of first, first fruits that um, Jesus would be our salvation. You'll be the firstborn from the dead. So this is what he brings. He reconciles us first and he brings us to our salvation we trust in him and his resurrected life and then we start to experience life so that's the passover week that we are going to ex we are experiencing and i ask you to celebrate that and to remember the lord but in that time of preparation the lord just led me to this time and i want to title this message preparation for passover and i want to read from john chapter 13 verses 2 to 17 and this is the account of jesus washing the feet of his disciples and this was a message that he, he shared with his disciples before he was crucified it was at the time of the passover meal and uh, they they the lord shared the, the the lord's supper with them and but here he came and he wanted to share some of these an example to them that they would remember for the rest of their lives and they would continue to do for the rest of their lives and i think that's pertinent to us as we we celebrate what the lord has done for us um, something of this remembrance is example to us of washing the feet. So I want to read from the scriptures and uh, please follow with me in your Bibles. And again, John chapter 13, verses 2 to 17. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and he was why he was not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. That is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor the messenger greater than the one sent for him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. So the title of my message today is Preparation for Passover, Preparing Our Hearts for What the Lord Has Us to Do. So in this context of celebrating Passover, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, him being the bread and the wine. He's taking our sin from us and he's established us in the new covenant. But then he comes and he reveals the washing of the feet of his disciples and he reveals his love that he has for men. God so loved the world that he sent his only son to come and die for us. And we know that the essence of this gospel is the love of God. It's the truth of the gospel is the love of God. Jesus loves sinners and he loves the saints. And yeah, he, he, he says to his disciples, I'm going to wash your feet and I'll go and wash others' feet. And that doesn't only mean saints, that means sinners also. So Jesus gives us an incredible example here about washing feet of others. Not so concerned about washing ourselves, but washing the feet of others. He was our example. He showed us what he wanted us to do. And amazingly through this, we see the Lord of all, the teacher, coming and humbling himself and being a servant. And we see in Philippians chapter 2 that 
he, he is a servant and uh, his servant heartedness was right through his ministry and today our Lord is still a servant and that's where we need to grow to we need to grow in, in servanthood and I want to just say it's one of the marks of Jesus and Christ in us is a servant heartedness it's one laying down one's life through many means to serve not just giving yourself to others but in prayer in dedication of loving others and sacrificially giving up yourself and that's truly the message of what, what went to the cross it was a servant heart obedient to the father right to the end that he went to the cross so when we look at this text there, there there's some points that i want to look at i want to look at first at peter then i want to look practically at some practical aspects and then some spiritual lessons from this so P peter we see what a man is a man sometimes that his heart wasn't always linked to his, his mouth and his mouth ran away from him and he was at times he would be impetuous and he would say things he, in, in a way sometimes Peter never thought and uh, he would he would say things and let his mouth blab away and I want to just say he got himself into trouble through that and his impetuousness but you know what the wonderful thing about Peter his heart was in the right place he loved the Lord and we see that in John 21, where the Lord restored him after his denial, he was questioned about his love for God. And he said to the Lord, you know, I love you. And God restored him and how mightily God used Peter. But the lesson learned from Peter is that we must guard our hearts. We mustn't be in a place where we just rattle off our mouths and don't think what we're saying. And we don't guard our hearts, what is coming from our, truly from our hearts. We need to be wise and that's why we have Christ within us and Christ enables us to allow the Holy Spirit to speak the very words of God through our mouths. So let's be on our guard from the words that we speak, that we may not be impulsive, that we not be one that will ramble on, that will not be impetuous in any way, but truly that when we speak, we speak the very words of God. And then practically out of this portion of scripture, we, we, we see again, and I want to re-emphasize Jesus shows us the way of servitude, and I wanted to say it's the only way to live. We, we don't live as anything else, as servants. We are servants of the Most High God. We minister to Him uh, from a servant heart. And I'm telling you, many people will, 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 will call themselves a servant, but their hearts are not servant. And I want to just say we need to examine our hearts to ensure that we are not only servant-hearted, but that we are doing the work of a servant. So what is this Jesus telling us first about this? So firstly, I want to say the work of a servant is humility. And humility is key for the kingdom of God. We see it in the Lord's life that he humbled himself and took on the nature of a human, even though he was very, very, very God himself. He took on the nature of a human being. And I want to just encourage us today that we need to be humble. Watch out for sin, the sin of pride. It's offensive and it's injurious to God. We need to be clothed in Christ. We need to be clothed in humility. We, we, we humble ourselves. God will lift us up. And truly, when we become humble in heart and word and deed, we will honor, will honor God and we will reveal God to many people. I want to just say, in the church and in the world today, humility is a, is a scarce commodity. Everyone has all the other things, but humility is a rarity. And I want you to encourage you to nurture that. And then secondly, one of the practical things that the Lord really encourages us is love. And we should delight in not only loving our God, but loving others and, and working to promote happiness and the joy of God in other people's lives. I want to just say the love of God through kindness and even in the little things is so important. How we get it so wrong in our lives. We, we, we tend to be harsh and hard. Maybe that's just me. But I want to just say we need to develop this aspect of the love of God in our hearts, not only through our words, but through our actions. Let's allow the kindness of God to flow through us. And how do we do that? We break it through self-denial. We deny self. We get up in self-sacrifice and allow God to flow through us so wonderfully by the Holy Spirit. You know, this love for men, and I've just been watching that. I'm sure we also focused on the news and We've seen all the, the statistics that are going th throughout the world. But what has happened to our hearts with this COVID-19? We're watching those maps and those big red dots, and we're watching the statistics of how many people have been infected and how many people are dying. Are we become statisticians and have no love for those men and those women? I want to just say, may we never get to that. May we always have the compassion 
And I want to ask you, please be praying, not only for our nation, but the nations of the earth. Pray for those that are sick, not only sick with COVID-19, but those with others, with cancer and many other diseases. May we never lose the compassion of God and may we never call upon the name of the Lord because he is still our healer and he can heal people. See, this command of love is so key for us as we go forward and remember what the Lord taught us. In John 13, verses 34 to 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But they will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You see, this love will change your world. And we have that love within us. See, the world doesn't understand doctrines and apologetics and all the fancy things that go behind understanding the Bible, even though we need to know those things. But they do understand humility and love, and we are able to do that. So let's humble ourselves and let's love those people that God brings across our path. And then finally, some spiritual lessons, three spiritual lessons from this. Firstly, is that if Christ does not wash you, you have no part of him. And I wanted to say we must realize that we must be thankful that the precious blood of Jesus cleanses us from, washes us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we need to have a heart of thankfulness and gratitude. I want to just say that only the wash believe. It's by faith that we receive the washing. How many people today have salvation and received their salvation and Jesus is Lord and they are born again? But how many have been washed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you allowed the Lord Jesus to truly wash you and to cleanse your conscience and that guilt and all that stuff that's inside of you? Can I even say the muck and the dirt and the pus? That a sinful nature produces have you allowed him to cleanse you to use his cleansing blood to wash you and to wipe you that you are holy and pure and righteous before god almighty it's a wonderful work it's a wonderful work allow jesus to cleanse you and to wash you by his blood and then secondly defilement why did jesus wash the feet of the disciples and at that time they walked with sandals and they walked in the dirt and it was the dust and the grime that got into their feet. And Jesus went to the dirtiest place of their bodies. But not only the dirtiest place, but it was a daily thing that every day they would be on those paths, on, on those roads, on those tracks, and they'll be getting dirty. And this is an indication that all of us, even though we are born again, as we live in this world, we get defiled by the world. And I wanted to say that Jesus comes to cleanse us and wash us on a daily basis. It's not something that we do when we just break bread together or we consider it when we've had an onerous sin in our lives. I want to say, keep your record short. As the Lord says, forgive us as we've trespassed against one another, as we forgive one another their trespasses. It's a daily thing. Allow your conscience to be clear. Allow the Lord and his blood and the powerful blood of Jesus to cleanse you regularly from any grime and dirt of an unclean, sinful nature where any sin will get into your life. And then lastly, it says, you are clean, but not all of you. And this is an indication that Judas Iscariot, even though he was part of Jesus' team, was not cleansed. And I want to just encourage you here is that not everyone that calls himself Christian, not everyone that has participated in baptisms, that attends church, is being cleansed by the Lord. So may we be wise as we hear what the Word of God says. So just to summarize in conclusion, number one, Christ loves sinners and saints. Number two, Peter acted in ignorance and impetuousness, but yet had a right heart. Maybe be careful of the words that we speak. Then practically clothe yourself with humility in Christ. Love one another as Christ has loved you. The world understands humility and love. And then the spiritual lessons are, if Christ doesn't wash you, you have no part of him. Defilement by the world, be cleansed daily by him. And if you, you are not all clean, you are clean, yet not all of you. So some of us, not saying any of you, but there may be those in our midst that are in that place. And if that's you, you can make right with the Lord. And I want to say to us today is that Jesus stands not only before the Passover to go to the cross, he stands today still the one that washes our feet and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And if that's you today, I'd like to pray for you, not only for you that know the Lord, but those who do not know the Lord, that Jesus can wash you and that he can cleanse you. 
So we, can we close our eyes and i like to pray. And will you make right with the Lord and allow him to wash you and to cleanse you? Father, as we prepare ourselves to understand the great sacrifice and the redemption that was paid for our, for our lives, this issue of sin and death, that Lord, your blood and the, and the purchase of your body paid the price that Lord, that we can be washed and we can be cleansed of all unrighteousness. So Father, I ask for everyone out there today that are in a place of grime and dirt, where sin has overcome them, where the world has been a strength, that Lord, your power of your blood as they submit to you and humble themselves before you and ask you in faith that they would be washed and be cleansed of all unrighteousness. So Lord, as we prepare our hearts to walk with you, a holy God, Will you continue to guide us and lead us in understanding this incredible sacrifice of your passing over us that can we be with you and experience your eternal life now in Jesus name. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, may God bless you and may this Passover be truly significant as you fix your eyes upon Jesus. God bless you all. Amen.